All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Uh, if you were with us over in the dinner, uh, you're probably sick of hearing me talk at this point, uh, so you can commiserate with my wife. Um, my name is Patrick Whalen. I'm the president's assistant. One of my responsibilities here at the college has been to work with doctors Scott Atlas, Jay Bhattacharya, and Martin Koldorf to establish and run the Academy for Science and Freedom. It was founded during a time of crisis in our country, a crisis in some ways, sadly, uh, instigated and perpetuated by what we now recognize as a systemic malpractice of science here in the US and abroad. The Academy for Science and Freedom exists to educate the American people about the free exchange of scientific ideas and the proper relationship between freedom and science in the pursuit of truth. The pursuit of truth, indeed, ought to be at the heart of every scientific endeavor. But the last couple of years have demonstrated that many of our scientific elites and bureaucrats think the heart of science is the manipulation of power rather than the apprehension of truth. The three founding fellows of the Academy for Science and Freedom who it's my pleasure to introduce this evening, worked closely with Dr. Arn throughout the pandemic, as you heard earlier, uh, to ensure that Hillsdale College could continue its nearly two century old educational work in a sane and sensible manner, free from arbitrary and ill-informed mandates masquerading as science. In the past year, they have continued that work through the Academy for Science and Freedom by addressing public audiences around the country, reaching millions, holding conferences with prominent doctors and scientists, challenging the rampant censorship that has afflicted the public discourse, publishing ethical principles for public health, which you may have picked up on your way in this evening, and counseling lawmakers at the state and local level. I'll begin by introducing each one of the fellows, and then I'll ask them all to come up at once. Uh, what will happen is uh, each one of the, our founding fellows is going to deliver remarks uh, in, su in succession, and then we'll have a good half an hour at the end um, where they'll be seated here and can field your questions. So Dr. Scott Atlas is the Robert Wesson Senior Fellow in Healthcare Policy at the Hoover Institution of Stanford University and a fellow at Hillsdale College's Academy for Science and Freedom. Dr. Atlas investigates the impact of government and the private sector on access, quality, and pricing in healthcare, global trends in healthcare innovation, and key economic issues related to the future of technology-based medical advances. From July to December of 2020, he served as special advisor to the president and a member of the White House Coronavirus Task Force. Before his appointment at Hoover, he was professor and chief of neuroradiology at Stanford University Medical Center for 14 years. His publications and interviews have appeared worldwide. Dr. Atlas is the author of numerous books, most recently, A Plague Upon Our House, My Fight at the Trump White House to Stop COVID from Destroying America. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, a professor at Stanford University School of Medicine in the Department of Health Policy, formerly in the Department of Medicine, and a fellow at Hillsdale College's Academy for Science and Freedom. He also directs the Center for Economics and Demography of Health and Aging at Stanford University. Dr. Bhattacharya's research currently focuses on the epidemiology of COVID-19, including the lethality of COVID-19 infection and the effects of lockdown policies. He is the co-author of the Great Barrington Declaration, which outlines a return to traditional public health principles for managing pandemics. Over his career, Dr. Bhattacharya has published over 150 articles in top peer-reviewed scientific journals in medicine, economics, health policy, epidemiology, statistics, law, public health, infectious, infectious disease epidemiology, and pediatrics, among other fields. I'm not sure there are any other fields, but. <laughs> Dr. Bhattacharya is the author of a top-selling textbook, Health Economics, which, use, which is used to teach undergraduate and graduate students worldwide. Finally, 
we will hear from Dr. Martin Koldorf, a biostatistician, an epidemiologist, and a professor of medicine at Harvard University on leave. He is senior scholar at the Brownstone Institute and a fellow at Hillsdale College's Academy for Science and Freedom. His research centers on developing and applying new disease surveillance methods for post-market drug and vaccine safety surveillance and for the early detection and monitoring of infectious disease outbreaks. Dr. Koldorf has developed new sequential statistics method, statistical methods for near real-time post-market drug and vaccine safety surveillance, where the purpose is to use weekly or other frequent data feeds to find potential safety problems as soon as possible. He has also developed tree-based scan statistic data mining methods for post-market drug and vaccine safety surveillance. He also is a co-author of the Great Barrington Declaration, which outlines a return to traditional public health principles for managing pandemics. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the founding fellows of the Academy for Science and Freedom. Okay, thank you, uh, Patrick, for that introduction. Thank you, Dr. Arn, for your vision and commitment to everything in this room that everyone in this room, uh, I think, feels also passionately about. And thank you all for coming. I'm going to start off by uh, presenting a, a talk called, I called it Science, Academia, and the Public Good, Restoring Trust in America's Institutions, because I think we're at the point where no matter what happened uh, directly about COVID, the lingering problem now is one of trust and a lack of trust in institutions that are critical to the success of this country and to any free society. America is in serious crisis. The government and what I call the credentialed class leading these essential institutions, and I mean public health agencies, universities, Doctors, scientists, schools, the media have been exposed. They've been exposed as non-expert and politicized. There is now an unprecedented denial of fact rampant in science and in public health leadership. As a society, during the pandemic, we have broken the social contract with our most precious resource, our children, harming them directly and failing as role models. And fundamentally, the free exchange of ideas that is essential to finding truth and to democracy in a free society is under threat now in the United States. The SARS pandemic, what happened? Well, there were several claims made early on that were initiated by the World Health Organization in the spring, early spring 2020. And they were wrong. And anyone who had any science knowledge after about five minutes, understood that they were calculating an infection fatality rate with the bottom of the fraction being way off because they only talked about people who were sick enough to go see a doctor rather than the many more people who had been infected. This was picked up by computer modelers, public health leaders, and then, given that this is a pandemic, the first ever in the era of social media, this was amplified over and over again. What was claimed was that the virus had a far higher fatality rate than the flu by several orders of magnitude, that everyone had a significant risk to die, that no one had immunity because the virus was novel, that everyone was dangerous and spreads the infection, that asymptomatic people are major drivers of the infection spread, that locking down will stop or even eliminate the virus, that masks will protect everyone and stop the spread of the infection, and that immune protection is only from getting a vaccine. All of these things were false. And they weren't just false because of learned knowledge. We knew they were all false, every one of those things, by spring of 2020. Huxley said facts do not cease to exist because they are ignored. We know what happened next. The U.S. enacted 
what I call the Burke's Fauci lockdowns. And that started as being called 15 days to slow the spread, which was rational because it meant Let's see if we could slow the infection spread so the hospitals don't get overwhelmed so we can treat patients, including non-COVID patients. But that quickly changed. And it changed at the leadership of two specific individuals, Deborah Burks, who was the White House Task Force Coordinator, officially, and who wrote all of the official guidance to every state, who visited dozens of states with the vice president as the face of the executive branch policy. Anthony Fauci was the second face of the executive branch federal policy because he had a, a very significant presence in the media. He was the most visible person, and then he was named by President Biden as chief medical advisor. As I said, the first policy flattened the curve, but that rapidly became stop all cases at all costs. And that meant lockdowns defined as clo school closures, business shutdowns, limits on medical care, restrictions and mandates, and quarantines of asymptomatic healthy people. And that result was twofold. Number one, it failed. There are over a million deaths attributed to the virus under that implemented policy. And the second part, besides abject failure, was it caused massive destruction, including death, particularly in the most vulnerable people of our society. And that includes children and families that are poor and low income. This is the result of the United States policy under two administrations. And this is not political. January 20th is, of course, when the administration changed hands. And we noticed that curve is a straight line, really. This is not a political statement on either administration. There's been no change in that incremental increasing deaths. It's important to understand lockdowners own the outcomes. They got what they wanted. Their policies were implemented. The safer alternative was, alternative was known by March 2020. It wasn't learned, it wasn't new. In fact, it was standard pandemic protocol since 15 years prior. And that was written about in the literature, in the public domain, by Johnny Anides, David Katz, myself, in March of 2020. Martin Kulldorff tried to get something published. He couldn't get something published in the United States. So he had published CNN Espanol. And that policy was called targeted protection, which meant increase the protection of the people who have a significant risk to die. But don't destroy everybody else. In fact, open society, particularly for medical care, schools, businesses, transportation, and monitor hospitals when needed. That was reiterated by several people over the course of the spring and early summer. Seven months later, the most important document in the pandemic was written. And it was written by two of the people on my right, Dr. Kulldorff, Dr. Bhattacharya, and Dr. Sunetra Gupta of the United Kingdom. And that's called the Great Barrington Declaration. And the most important part of that to me is that it gave people something official to say, yes, I agree with that. And there's something like a million people that have agreed with that. What's the risk and for whom? I think everybody knows this, although somehow it's, not, it's never been emphasized. The risk is to people who are older, several thousandfold higher risk of death for people who are old compared to those who are young. And for perspective, in most countries, the average age of COVID death is older than the life expectancy. That doesn't diminish the significance of dying from COVID, but this is the perspective of a rational person. Two-thirds of people who died in the United States from COVID have greater than or equal to six comorbidities. This is a disease that when it kills people, most of them are very frail and old. The case for opening schools 
was already known in spring-summer 2020, yet the United States was one of the only countries of our peer nations that closed schools for fall 2020. The rationale I presented at the White House in an event, because I thought, okay, what am I gonna do? I got there August 1st, basically. What's the most important thing? Open the schools. Because healthy children do not have a high risk from the virus, because the harms of closing in-person schools are enormous, and there is nothing, in my view, more important to any civilized society than educating its children. We also knew from the spring 2020 closures that online learning was a failure. It was recognized throughout the world, and it, had not, it was not due to lack of broadband. That is a complete fallacy. Netherlands has the highest penetration of broadband in the world, and they had a massive drop in learning. The losses were beyond learning. Everyone here, you don't have to be a parent to understand that we need to, you socialize in school, you need, you learn conflict resolution, physical activity. In people who are poor, it's the most nutritious meal of the day for their child. It's where problems with hearing and visual impairment are discovered in school. You don't get that on a computer. And all of these losses are far greater for minorities and the poor. For a society that's focused and says it's focused over and over again on helping poor people and low-income families, it was a gross failure. America closed its schools, and what happened? Well, first we see that that square box is, compared to the previous year, hospital medical visits to doctors dropped every month for physical illness. That's because COVID care was, non-COVID care was shut down and people were so afraid they weren't seeking medical care. But this is psychiatric illness in teenagers exploded during the uh, lockdowns every month. This is self-harm visits, double to triple, kids putting cigarettes out on their skin because they were isolated from the lockdowns. This is psychiatric illness in college-age students, anxiety, depression exploding during the lockdowns. This is drug abuse in teenagers. This is not due to the virus. This is due to the man-made decision of locking down. Lockdowns inflicted worldwide harms, particularly to children. Not to mention the one and a half billion children worldwide that were shot out of education. More than 100 million more children underwent sexual abuse, genital mutilation, childhood pregnancies. That's the reality that the other side never talks about. That chart is from the journal, the magazine Economist, which shows an explosion in the percentage of children that cannot read or understand a simple phrase in the world. Mandela said there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. America failed. The lockdowns were a failure. This is the data. This is not an opinion. This is Bjornskov, March 2021. 24 European countries evaluated. There was no decrease in, in death with lockdowns. That's the reason the lockdowns were done, because we were going to, quote, save people's lives. This is a Stanford study, Ben David and colleagues. They did not find that stricter lockdowns prevented the growth of cases. The spread of cases was not stopped. This is National Bureau of Economic Research, Rand Institute, June 2021, looking at 43 countries and the United States. And they found that when the lockdowns were employed, the deaths increased, which of course makes sense when the lockdowns meant staying inside in proximity to people while they were closing the beaches. This is a study from January 22, Johns Hopkins. They looked at all the studies in the, in, the, in the world, and their bottom line conclusion is lockdown policies were ill-founded and shouldn't be rejected as a pandemic policy instrument. There was not a dramatic decrease in mortality, and they, they were associated with significant harms. We knew this. This was standard pandemic management 15 years before this pandemic. This is the latest study, April 2022. 
Kirpin, and others, including University of Chicago economist Casey Mulligan, analyzed 50 states and quantified how they did with pandemic management in three ways, death, harms to the economy, and harms to education. This is the top set of states. You'll notice that in the top five are two of the states that didn't lock down, South Dakota and Florida. This is the worst state's performance. Illinois, California, New York, New Jersey. If you're wondering, Michigan ranked 40th. Feynman said it does not matter who you are or how smart you are or what title you have or how many of you there are and certainly not how many papers your side has published. If your prediction is wrong, your hypothesis is wrong, period, that's science. Lockdowns hurt low-income families yet spared the affluent, one of the great sins of the lockdowners. This is the significant drop in employment. You'll notice that the lower and sustained drop is in the low-income jobs. This is the significant drop in educational level. The lower educational level is the low-income families. This is the job losses that persist, that are separated on the basis of wage. Low-income job losses are persistently much lower than higher income. This was a massive destruction at the expense of the middle class and the lower class for the benefit of the affluent. And that's why it's called a luxury of the rich. Lockdowns are a luxury of the rich. That's a phrase borrowed from Serena. I mean, uh, from Sunetra. OK, lockdowns, economic harms, equal lives lost. This was known for decades, yet the economists were silent. I was asked to co-author this paper in the spring of 2020 by an economist at University of Chicago. But none of my colleagues were working on this or talking about it. And so we did, and we said that by spring of 2020, the number of life years lost was double from the lockdowns than it was from the virus. That went unnoticed. Lockdowns directly killed people. Why? Well, medical care was shut down. Half of 650,000 US chemo patients didn't seek their chemo. They have cancer on chemo. They were afraid to go in. They were made to, afraid, made to be afraid. Stroke, heart attack. These half the people didn't call an ambulance. Organ transplants, 85% decrease from the previous year. I won't go through all this data, but suffice it to say that over the next 20 years, it's estimated that 1.2 million Americans will die from the unemployment and economic downturn alone. And most of those are low-income people. I want to talk about vaccines, but only in this context. To me, COVID vaccines in children are a case study in defining a virtuous society. COVID vaccines in the United Kingdom, the margin of benefit is too small to support advice on a universal program of vaccination of healthy 12 to 15-year-old children. Because remember, the risk to children that are healthy is infinitesimally small from the disease. COVID vaccines in Finland. Participation in vaccination is voluntary. People under 16 who are not at a risk group will not be vaccinated. That's Finland. Norway, for children who are offered the vaccine under 16, that's their age of consent, parents must consent to vaccination, must consent. And in the case of joint parental responsibility, both parents must consent. And again, vaccination is voluntary. That's Norway. Denmark, I'm not going to read the Danish here. <laughs> but they published something that said, from July 1 onward, it will no longer be possible for children and young people under the age of 18 to get the first jab, and from September 1, will no longer be possible to get the second. That's Danish Health Authority. How did the American media react to that? 
They immediately published a fact check, fact check, they called it. Denmark did not ban COVID vaccines for children. And if you read that small writing there, they said, well, because they said children at high risk can still get the vaccine. So they didn't ban that's false on social media. These people are right-wing lunatics who are saying that. I added that. They didn't say that. <laughs> what about the U.S.? Eric Rubin, the editor-in-chief of the New England Journal, said, but we're never going to learn about how safe the vaccine is unless we start giving it. That's just the way it goes. That's an FDA advisory meeting on vaccine approval specifically in children. It's even worse. This is a clinical trial going on from the NIH. And in, in red at the bottom, not only are they doing the vaccine trials on healthy children, who again, have no significant risk from COVID, healthy children. They're saying they're gonna do the vaccines on children under six months of age. This is the paper that came out of that work so far on children five to 11. And you'll notice, you can't read it probably, but at the bottom are some of our favorite academic research medical centers, Duke University, Stanford University. To me, this is a massive break of medical ethics to use an experimental drug on young children who are healthy, who have no significant risk from the illness you're giving them the vaccine for. To me, US public health ethics have disappeared. This was a statement. If a school is implementing a testing strategy, testing should be offered on a voluntary basis. It is unethical and illegal to test someone who does not want to be tested, including students whose parents do not want them to be tested. That's not even about vaccines. That's just forced testing. That was said by the CDC, posted by the CDC in October of 2020. Not only have the ethics disappeared, that document has disappeared. I happen to have it. That's removed from the internet. Why did the public believe lockdowners? Well, we are of a culture of trust. We trust the credentials. There's a lot of fear in society, understandable fear of COVID, but also fear of those who didn't believe or agree of speaking out a cancel culture, which I'm going to talk about. And then, of course, media and politics in the United States really are vicious, and there's been a real demonization of anyone who speaks otherwise. The public believe two key lies. Number one, if you're against lockdowns, you're choosing the economy over lives. That was known to be a lie, as I illustrated. And also, if you're against lockdowns, you're somehow for allowing the infection to spread without mitigation, the so-called herd immunity strategy, which you've heard a lot about. And of course, no one here ever said anything like that. That was never said, never advised to the president. I never even heard anyone discuss that in the White House. That's called propaganda because that was perpetrated onto the public. The media amplified that. This is a meeting that we had with Sunetra Gupta uh, October 5, 2020, with HHS Secretary Alex Azar. We talked about a lot of things. We never talked about herd immunity. It was never even mentioned. We have the transcript of the meeting. Yet, The Hill, who interviewed us, claimed Trump health officials meet with doctors pushing herd immunity. And that sentence there says that this strategy is gaining momentum to let the infection spread without mitigation with Scott Atlas and others. That's a complete lie. We saw that piece. We, two of us, called the author of that piece. And shamefully, they wouldn't retract it. We never talked about that. America's media is unique. It's uniquely poisonous. This is all COVID stories in English-speaking media, quantified as negative or positive, the non-U.S. media, 54% negative. U.S. media, 91% negative. In 2020, the U.S. media stories of increasing cases outnumbered the stories of decreasing cases by a factor of over five, even when the cases were declining. 
This was known. In fact, it wasn't enough that they were lying. They also censored information. These are two different articles quantifying how YouTube is proudly saying that they're censoring information. We were all censored in various ways, and many others were. I'm pointing out my own experience because uh, I think it, ha it makes a certain point. September 11th, YouTube pulled down an interview I did on COVID, but the interview was up for, for four months. As soon as I got to Washington, they pulled it down and said it's misinformation. It wasn't misinformation before I was standing next to President Trump on the podium. October 18th, Twitter deleted my post as advisor to the president on COVID, talking about the data, quoting the data on masks. I would think that the American people would want to hear what the advisor to the president was saying about the biggest health care crisis in 100 years. But no, it wasn't allowed. And even later, I had left in November. Jay and I and Martin went down to work with uh, Governor DeSantis in a press conference. YouTube filmed it, and they pulled it down and said it's misinformation. By November 2020, Facebook had taken down 7 million posts on the, on the pandemic, and they bragged about it in the Washington Post. Some people in the media understood. This is the Wall Street Journal editorial board saying the public could be forgiven for wondering if Dr. Atlas's appointment as a White House coronavirus advi advisor last month has made him a political target. This is a Federalist saying his opinions have become of greater interest due to his appointment in August as a presidential advisor. That fact alone ought to make it vital that the public hears his opinions. It's not just the media. In Galileo's time, it was said the real problem is vested academic interests. Scientific journals block the scientific process, even if people are dying. This is The Lancet, February 2020. You may remember this paper, a bunch of famous virologists got together and submitted a letter with no data saying, we stand together to strongly condemn conspiracy theories suggesting that COVID does not have a natural origin. This is February 2020. It's not even known today, frankly. It could not have been known that it was a natural virus in 2020, February. The universities are censoring people because they perceive them as political opponents. How do I know that? Because I'm talking about Stanford University, where I work. There were three scientists there, John Ioannidis, me, and Jay Bhattacharya. We all said the exact same thing about who's at risk, the risk to children, immunity, masks not being effective, schools should open, lockdowns were wrong, and focus protection was the way to go. We said the exact same thing. Yet Stanford University faculty members in the medical school got together and wrote and posted a letter condemning me personally uh, and trying to sort of cancel me. This is a list of almost 100 people. Just to flash it up there to show the reality of what was going on here. That kind of shame, that, that kind of behavior is shameful. When you have somebody criticized and delegitimized because they have the audacity to try to help the country under a president that you personally despise, that's shameful conduct, harmful to the national interest, and a gross failure as a role model to our youth. How do I know it's political? This is the voting of Stanford's zip code. 95% Joe Biden, 3% Trump, when California was 2 to 1 Biden to Trump. This also was noticed, and this was written about, that cancel culture had come to medicine, and it was called mob rule. Public health is now politicized. Not sure you can read that, but this is the public support by party of opening K through 12 schools. And there's a massive difference between Republicans and Democrats. That should never happen. 
There should not be a political ingredient in the leadership of public health or in the acceptance of public health. Science itself, trust in science, has been politicized. It was always about equal two parties, and then look what happened. Massive distrust by the Republicans. There's something wrong. Can we restore trust? Yes. There are many specific things to do. We don't have time to go through them. But first and foremost, we have to restate and then insist on the ethical principles that were broken in public health. And we just did that in the Academy for Science and Freedom. We have to demand accountability, including admission of errors in public forums. Anyone who's married knows how good it is to say you're wrong when you're wrong. And there are many other things to do, including uh, require transparency, and I think Martin and Jay will talk about that. I just want to point out, but the most essential ingredient of all, to stop what is going on, is leaders must rise up. This is a leader. Martin Koldorf stood up when that letter was written. It said, I would be delighted to debate this with any of the 98 signatories in the Stanford newspaper. Zero took him up on that challenge. <laughs> Another way is to bring in more experts. And I brought in Jay and Martin, Joe Ladapo, Cody Meisner, to see the president in the Oval Office. And this is, why, this is where we are in August of 2020. Why? because the President of the United States needs to have people who are doing the research to answer his questions. This was blocked internally, and I went crazy and got it done, uh, much of the dismay of people who are trying to block it. We also need to start new institutions, and that's what this is about. This is the Academy for Science and Freedom. This is Dr. Arn introducing us three at the Kirby Center in Washington. I think this, there is nothing more important. If we are a society that doesn't believe in facts anymore, I don't even know where to go from there. We need to fix science. It's broken. This is the document that we just posted on the website. I encourage all of you to take the handout or to look at it on the website, where we co-authored with several other leaders uh, all over the country, in fact, some in the, uh, outside the US, on restating what shouldn't even need to be restated about the ethical principles of public health. And last comment here, it took the Catholic Church 359 years to admit that Galileo was right and the earth moved. <laughs> I'm not so sure I have the confidence that we're going to beat 359 years here. <laughs> Lastly, Winston Churchill, Dr. Arne's favorite said, truth is incontrovertible, panic may resent it, ignorance may deride it, malice may distort it, but there it is. Thank you very much. Not sure I'm going to follow that, but <laughs> I'll, uh, it's been an absolute honor and inspiration of a lifetime to be able to work with, uh, with uh, Dr. Atlas and Dr. Kuldorf through the pandemic. Uh, I want to focus my remarks on uh, a, a narrower topic, because uh, this is the, uh, the Academy of Science and Freedom, and I want, to, I want to understand how the federal science bureaucracy corrupted science. And at the end, uh, after I finish my story, I'll, I'll offer one suggestion for how to, how to start to fix it, but I'm hoping in the, the Q&A we can have a, a more robust discussion about this. Uh, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think like three, three points I want to make. Um, first, that the, the, the lockdowns were an absolutely extraordinary measure that were unprecedented in human history. And in fact, what I'm going to show you is that they were not part of the standard pandemic plans that we had in place at the start of the pandemic. Uh, the second point I want to make is that the way that the lockdowns were instituted, the, 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 the key thing was the creation of an illusion of scientific consensus. 
that actually did not exist even when they were implemented and never throughout the pandemic. And this illusion was created by federal bu bureaucrats working to, to essentially fool the American people into thinking that they were following the science. <laughs> um, and uh, last, I'll talk very briefly about how we might be able to fix this. Because I do think that one of the, the great opportunities to come out of the pandemic is the sense that we are in crisis as a society, uh, that, that, that a way that science can be used to rule the lives of people is, is not right. And we can stand up to that and transform it, to reform it in a, in a way that science can have its proper place in society. That, in fact, that's what the Academy of Science and Freedom is all about. Okay, uh, first, pandemic plans. Uh, do you know this person? It's really unjust that most people in the room don't know this person. This, this person is the man that s s rid the world of smallpox. If you've ever not worried about smallpox, it's thanks to this man. He's probably the most important epidemiologist of the 20th century. His name is uh, Donald Henderson. Um, he died in 2016, there's a, his obituary in the New York Times. Um, he, uh, the reason I put, you, put, put this picture of this man up is that if he had been alive six years later, or, or four, I guess four years later in 2020, we probably would not have had the lockdown because he would have stopped, he would, he would have stood up against it. How, how do I know this? In uh, uh, 2006, he wrote a paper uh, called the, the very horrible title, Disease uh, Mitigation Measures in, the, in Control of Pandemic Influenza. I can see you falling asleep already. But this is super exciting and interesting. Um, <laughs> let, me, let, me show you, let me show you just some, some choice quotes. I'm going to read it because it's really worth hearing his words. Um, As experience shows for quarantines, there is no basis for recommending quarantines either for groups or individuals. This is in case of pandemic influenza, including influenzas that we've experienced during our lifetime. The problems in implementing such measures are formidable, and secondary effects of absenteeism and community disruption, as well as possible adverse consequences, such as loss of public trust in government and stigmatization of quarantine groups and people, are likely to be considerable. He was right, wasn't he? That's 2006. Um, uh, okay, a communication strategy and plan. Open and frequent communications with the public are essential. That usually means not lying to the public, right? Um, th this involves regular press conferences, FaceTimes, and pro uh, proximity of information through civic leaders, churches, schools, and businesses. An important message is to request that all uh, who are ill remain isolated, stay at home if you're sick, or in the hospital, but to encourage others to continue to come to work so that essential services can be sustained. Any word about healthy people staying at home? Uh, and last one, last, uh, this, this whole paper is worth reading, but this is the best part. Uh, an overriding principle. Experience has shown that communities faced with epidemics or other adverse events respond best and with the least anxiety when the normal social function of community or at least is least disrupted. Strong political and public health leadership to provide reassurance and ensure that needed medical services are provided to are critical elements. If either is seen to be less than optional, a manageable epidemic could move toward catastrophe. A society that functions calmly in the face of danger is the best way to manage a pandemic, is what he said. Now, he would have stood up for this. And I think, I, I think if he'd lived for four years longer, we would not have had a lockdown. The man that stopped the, the uh, that, that eradicated smallpox from the face of the earth. Okay, what did we get instead? Um, <laughs> So uh, you don't recognize the man on the left. The man on the left is Cliff Lane. He was Tony Fauci's deputy. I, I put him up because he, he played a really central role in the lockdown, the adoption of lockdown. And of course, everyone recognize that man in the middle over there? Uh, um, Tony Fauci, the head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. Um, in February of 2020, the World Health Organization 
had a delegation sent to China to try to understand what happened in China and how they controlled the pandemic, how they stopped the disease from spreading. They sent two people. One uh, was a Stanford-trained epidemiologist named Maria Kirchhoff. That's on, she's on top. And then on the bottom is Cliff Lane. Cliff Lane is Tony, is Tony Fauci's deputy. Uh, it, it's, there was a whole series of, of, of Freedom of Information Act requests that, that were required to get this information to, to you all, just so you could see this. Um, on the flight home from China, they wrote a report. Um, this report is called uh, uh, Report of the World Health Organization China uh, Joint Mission on the Coronavirus Disease. So they, 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 were, they were flying home, r rapidly typing this report up um, in February 2020, February 2020, about three or four weeks before the lockdown was implemented in the United States. Uh, let me read this to you. Prepare, here, this, is, this is the advice that they gave. Remember, we just listened to Don Henderson's advice. Um, prepare to immediately activate the highest level of emergency response mechanisms to trigger the all of government and all of society approach that is essential for early containment of COVID-19. They came back saying that not just American society, Maria Kirchhoff worked for the World Health Organization, but all of world society should lock down. Um, there's an email that Cliff Lane sent to the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease as, as soon as he came back home. And here's what he wrote to Tony Fauci. He wrote, uh, China has demonstrated this infection can be controlled, albeit at great cost. That is the bottom line from my perspective. The global community needs to decide the way forward. That room needs more than this group. Uh, I'm not sure that President Trump ever saw this email. In fact, I'm pretty sure he probably didn't see this email. Um, what, what Cliff Lane was suggesting is that China, what China did, locking down its, uh, its, uh, one of its largest cities, Wuhan, uh, had worked. We'd gotten rid of the disease, they'd gotten rid of the disease, and all we had to do was follow their example. And we also could get rid of the disease. Uh, okay, I, I'm not gonna belabor this, because uh, Scott did a fantastic job telling you about the collateral harms of lockdown. Um, the, the effects of this were entirely predictable. Don Henderson, before he died, predicted it. Uh, and I'll just, I just picked some, some, a, a few pictures to show you. Uh, in uh, tw March of 2020, India also locked down, actually partly on the advice of the World Health Organization and partly because they were following Tony Fauci, who had an enormous impact not just on American public policy and public health, but worldwide. Uh, I spoke to Indian epidemiologists who would often cite him. Um, and what happened was on that first day when they locked down, nearly a half a billion people, migrant workers who work hand to mouth in cities around India, were told they had to walk back to their, or get back somehow to their home villages, sometimes a thousand miles away. Now, working hand to mouth means I buy a coconut, I then sell the coconut to some rich Mumbai uh, IT worker, then um, with that money, I buy more coconuts and I feed my family. And those more coconuts I sell the next day. When India locked down, the life savings of a half billion migrant workers disappeared overnight. And on the march back home, which some uh, academics have called the, the new trail of tears, a thousand poor migrant workers died overnight. Uh, this was from the UN in uh, 2020. The virus linked hunger tied to 10,000 child deaths each month. Why did, did hunger happen? Well, we, we globalized our world economy, didn't we, over the last 30 years? It was an enormous success. A, a billion people lifted out of poverty. Poor countries around the world reorganized their economies to fit into the global economy. And overnight, we broke it. And hundreds of millions of people, 100 million people were thrown into poverty. And tens of millions of people faced severe hunger. And 10,000 child deaths each month. Uh, in May of 2021, this is from the BBC, uh, the, the UN estimated that the, just in that year alone, 230,000 children had died from hunger in, just in South Asia. 
I'm focusing on India because I'm of Indian extraction. I could do this for Africa. I could do this for every poor country on earth. Every poor person on earth was harmed materially, sometimes to death, as a consequence of the decisions that Western countries took to lock down. Uh, uh, this is Ghana. Uh, these, these are kids from Ghana. There are 15 million children in Ghana. And uh, actually, is this from Ghana? No, this is Uganda. Yeah, sorry. This is, I, I, I have one from Ghana, too, which is pretty bad. But this, is, this, one's, this one's even worse. Uganda. There's 15 million kids in Uganda. And four and a half million, for two years, they were out of school. Not remote school. Very few of them had access to the internet to have remote school. Just out of school. Four and a half million of those kids never showed up after the schools reopened. This is a catastrophe for the world's poor. Uh, it's also a catastrophe for, for American kids. This is from the New York Times just, uh, just yesterday. Um, I love the phrasing. The pandemic erased two decades of progress in math and reading, because the scores whew, was already not so good before, I think, for <laughs> the pandemic. Um, but it wasn't the pandemic that did this. And it was poor families that faced the worst of it. And it's poor families in blue states, largely, that closed the schools that caused that where, where this, this pandemic learning loss has happened. Um, the consequences of this we're going to be paying for for a very long time, or kids are going to be paying for. Because it's, it's uh, a fact that if you interrupt a child's education for even a short time, they pay the harms of that over their entire life. They lead poorer, less healthy, shorter lives. Uh, and there were, in fact, an estimate during the pandemic that just the spring lockdowns alone robbed our children of five and a half million life years over the next decades. Okay, uh, the Great Barrington Declaration. Uh, I gotta say, I gotta tell you something. Um, I love this, I love this, probably my proudest moment is, is writing and signing this Great Barrington Declaration. Um, but I'll tell you, and you'll see this immediately as soon as I show it to you, there's not one original thought in it. Because, and this is how you apparently, how you get, how, how, you, uh, how, how, you, do, how you say something important. You just steal <laughs> shamelessly from the very best people. Um, uh, the, so the Great Barrington Declaration, uh, we signed it in 20, October 4th, 2020. There's Sinatra Gupta in the middle, and there's Martin Kuldorf. I've been told this looks like a rock star video kind of thing. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, maybe Martin does. Um, the, the idea is so simple. You have this age gradient. Old people are at high risk from the disease. Young people are, are much lower, almost vanishingly low risk. Whereas young people, especially, everyone's harmed by lockdown, but especially young people, interrupting their lives is, is, is harmful. What should you do? Well, uh, you care about care, taking care of people who are, who are a threat from illness. So you care for the old. You focus protection on the old. You make sure that people have the resources they need so that they don't, for instance, organize campaigns to have deliveries when there's high case rates uh, to older people living next door. Make available for, for older people living in uh, multi-generational homes, make available hotel rooms. We made hotel rooms available for young homeless people. Why not make it available for older people so that if, you know, uh, jo grandson Johnny comes home and says, or calls and says, Grandma, I think I was exposed to the virus, she calls up public health and says, can I have a place to stay for a couple of days? Right, very simple kinds of ideas. Local public health fully had it in their capacity to be creative and think of ways to protect older people. Other societies did this. Um, for the rest of society, especially for children, Let's just follow the Don Henderson plan. Don't disrupt their lives. Don't panic people. Allow our children to go to school. Um, told you, we stole the ideas. Simplest plan in the world, right? Makes complete sense. Um, we wrote this on October 4, 2020. Uh, here's, here's the focus protection, better protection of the old. Um, the, we wrote this on October 4, 2020, where uh, the emphasis is on protecting the old and then opening society for the young. Um, the um, plan was followed by Sweden. I, 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 leave this, I show this here just to give you a sense of what perfect focus protection can look like. What Sweden did when the vaccines came was that they, they vaccinated all of their old population. 
In fact, they were so strict about it that when a 40-year-old Swedish public health official sneakily vaccinated himself, uh, they fired him. <laughs> they made sure that all of the doses... Now, Sweden, like the rest of Europe, actually was relatively slow in the early days of the vaccination campaign. Every dose in Sweden went to an older person. And so, so on the top, you see cases. You see this big hump. You have these two humps. looks like a camel. In winter, there was a big wave of cases in Sweden. And then, then again in the spring, there was a big wave of cases in Sweden. On the bottom, you see deaths. The first wave, when the, the, the winter wave, there was no vaccine. You see all a huge number of deaths. By vaccinating the old, they'd, they basically had decoupled cases and deaths. That second wave, do you see a second hump at the bottom? No deaths. Because they had protected the old. That is what the end point of this pandemic is. Cases forever, but not producing deaths because we protected people. Um, and by the way, your immunity, if you've any, who, who in the room has had COVID and recovered? You're pretty well protected, about as, about as well as you can be. Um, doesn't mean you're not going to get it again. Just means that you're, you're, when you get it, it's likely to be less severe than the first time. Uh, no promises. <laughs> this is science, right? Um, <laughs> four, four days after we wrote the, the Great Barrington Declaration, um, we, the, uh, the head of the National Institute of Health, a man named Francis Collins, wrote an email. I've long admired the man. I have to say, it pains me to talk about this, uh, about him doing this. Uh, it, I, honestly, it does. I, 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 and and this, is, it's, this is, I don't mean this... Uh, in any false way. I mean, I, I, I've admired his career forever. Um, so, but four days after we wrote the Great Barrington Declaration, October 8th, a million people, almost a million people had signed it. Tens of thousands of epidemiologists and doctors had signed it. Uh, a, a Nobel Prize winner at Stanford signed it. Uh, Scott, were you allowed to sign it? You must have signed it. I intentionally didn't sign it. Scott didn't it. sign it. Because I was in the White House. I didn't want to He wasn't in the, he's in the White House. Okay. <laughs> but see, you can tell, he, he, Scott also had these same ideas. It's not like any of this was, was particularly original, right? Um, the point is, there was an enormous community of scientists who understood that the lockdowns were a, a huge mistake. Four days after we wrote the Great Barrington Declaration, after this huge outpouring, let me read the email to you. Um, it's a little painful, so, you know. Uh, Hi, Tony and Cliff. Tony is Tony Fauci. Cliff is Cliff Lane, the man who went on that junket to China I showed you earlier. Hi, Tony and Cliff. Uh, CGBDeclaration.org. That's, that's my website. I love that's a website. Um, the proposal uh, from the three fringe epidemiologists, that's, that's me. Wait, that's me, Martin Kuldorf, and Sunetra Gupta. <laughs> St <laughs> St Stanford. He, I, where were you, Martin? He was, at, he was at Harvard, I think. A fringe school, if I ever heard of one. And then and Sunetra Gupta at Oxford University. Um, uh, this proposal for three French epidemiologists who met with a secretary, that's the picture that, 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 uh, that, that Scott showed you, uh, Secretary Azar, seems to be getting a lot of attention. This is four days, by the way, after we wrote this. And to even a co-signature from a Nobel Prize winner, Mike Levitt at Stanford. That's my friend. He, a Nobel Prize winner signed it. It's fringe epidemiology, right? Um, there needs to be a quick and devastating published takedown of the premises. I don't see anything like that online yet. Is it underway? I have a business card. This is not the one. This is my official one. I have an unofficial one printed up with fringe epidemiologists, which is now <laughs> my official title. <laughs> then we got stories like this. Uh, Scott showed you one from The Hill. Uh, Trump wants to try for herd immunity. Without a vaccine, it could kill millions. We'd already killed millions in people starving in poor parts of the world. Uh, we, we didn't mention herd immunity. I started getting calls from reporters, and I was puzzled. They asked me, Jay, uh, or they'd say Dr. Bhattacharya, they'd be nice to me. Uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, w why do you want to let the virus rip? I was really, I was honestly puzzled, because the words let it rip does not appear in the Great Barrington Declaration. 
I actually never thought about letting the virus rip. I mean, gosh, I mean, that, that, that seems like a really, uh, you know, I, I, I thought we'd argued for focus protection. Um, instead, we got this. A coordinated propaganda campaign to destroy the reputations of anybody that signed it. Coordinated by the government, by the American federal government. Uh, Tony Fauci uh, responded to Francis Collins uh, with an email, too busy with other things to worry about this. They are too busy. They, meaning the White House, is too busy to worry about this, this story, that the Washington Post story that I just showed you. Francis Collins quoted calling, calling us, uh, at, accusing us of wanting to irresponsibly infect the entire American population. They, the White House, is too busy with what? The election. This is October 2020. Um, to worry about this. What you said was entirely correct. Tony Fauci, rubber stamped fringe epidemiology. Uh, Francis Collins responds, my quotes are accurate, I, but I will not be appreciated by the White House. Um, and he doubled down. When he, res when he finally resigned as head of the NIH, he went on Fox News and was asked about this. And he said he stood by, the, stood by it a full year later. OK, uh, last, last slide about reform. How do we fix things? I'm just, I'm just going to give one idea. One idea. There's many more that's going to be needed, but I wanted to like, emphasize this idea because I, I like it sort of the because it's so clean and easy to understand. Um, <laughs> we need a, a a wall, a real wall, between science and the science funders. Yeah. Uh, what, is it is it okay if a, if a if a if a if if you have a pharmaceutical company executive make decisions about whether to approve or not approve drugs by the FDA. Seems like there'd be a conflict of interest there, right? When you have powerful science funders like Francis Collins, like Tony Fauci, who say, uh, you know, I really think that if you, if a lockdown is the right way to go. Now, they control $40 billion of money. 40. Now, it's not just that funds the work of nearly every prominent epidemiologist, immunologist, and virologist in the country. It's not just money they control. So I, I teach at Stanford University. In order to get tenure at the, at the School of Medicine at Stanford University, it's almost a requirement that you get NIH funding. It's, it's a sort of mark of you've, you've, you've succeeded because you've convinced the NIH to, to give you money. It's how you attain status within science. When the, a scientific funder prominent scientific funder like Tony Fauci says it, uh, that lockdowns are the only way. Everyone else who, who disagrees with him is our, it, what does he say? He said, uh, it, if you d disagree with him, you're not simply disagreeing with a man. You are disagreeing with science. Um, the, I don't know if you speak French. I, I, I thought of Louis XIV, uh, la science c'est moi. Or, <laughs> no, Louis said, no, he said, he had some other quote. It was something very close to that, right? Um, the, it's, um, it's, you do it at risk to your own success as a scientist. So what needs to happen is a bright wall, just like there's a bright wall between pharmaceutical company executives and the FDA, that's at least there's supposed to be one. <laughs> OK, we can have bright walls all over the place. Um, there's, but this one is a new one that I hadn't thought of before, the pandemic. There needs to be a bright wall between scientific funders making decisions about who to fund and their participation in health policy, because that is a deep conflict of interest that silences scientists, creates an illusion of consensus that doesn't exist, fools the American people, fools the world population in doing things that are very, very dangerous. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here at Hillsdale College, uh, such a beautiful place with wonderful people. So uh, thank you from, uh, from the bottom of my heart for inviting us here. Um, uh, COVID was, is not the first pandemic. Uh, we've had uh, uh, pandemics for, uh, for thousands of years. 
So uh, ever since I was a teenager, I've been very interested in history. So what can we learn about infectious diseases from uh, history? Uh, well, um, in 430 BC, uh, we have the plague of Athens. It also affected other places. And uh, uh, Thucydides, who survived this plague, he wrote the following. Those who, have had, those who had recovered from the disease had now no fear for themselves. For the same man was never attacked twice, never at least fatally. <laughs> so uh, the Greek, they knew that if you've had an infection, then you had immunity, and you were not at high risk again. Uh, so we knew that uh, two and a half thousand years ago. So now we're going to go forward in time a little bit. Uh, <laughs> so this was part of a, a letter written, uh, they call it a memorandum written in, in the Lancet, which uh, uh, was supposed to be one of the prestigious uh, uh, medical journals in the world. Uh, it says, there is no evidence for lasting protective immunity to SARS-CoV-2 following natural infection. Um, this was signed by Rochelle Walensky and, and about 40 other people, and later by hundreds of others who did it afterwards. Um, the reason I put Rochelle Walensky is here a few months after these words. Uh, she was appointed the director of CDC. So uh, uh, it's pretty amazing how the, our knowledge about infections can change over two and a half thousand years. It's even more amazing that uh, for uh, from 430 BC to 2019, we knew one thing, and then in the last two years, we're suddenly forgetting about all of that. <laughs> so this is only one example of how we have lost touch with science and the truth and so on. Uh, so in uh, October 2020, uh, when Scott was censored one of several times, uh, my comment on Twitter was that uh, we have now come to the end of the age of enlightenment, of scientific enlightenment. Uh, I think it was 400 years ago when uh, Tycho Brahe, Johannes Kepler, Galileo, uh, Descartes, they sort of put down the foundation of modern science. And uh, with very open, inquisitive mind, with uh, good, debased discussions. But now, if we can't have this discourse in science, then we can't have enlightenment. Either you have both discourse and enlightenment. If you don't have discourse, there is no enlightenment. That's a pretty stunning and scary thought, I think, that we're heading into such a direction. Um, so. Uh, One way would be to replace Rochelle Walensky with Scott or Jay. <laughs> and whoever doesn't replace Rochelle could replace uh, Anthony, I guess. Uh, but there is actually a more structural problem here. It's not just an issue of, of uh, personalities, that the wrong person happened to get into the wrong position, because we should have a system that's robust enough to deal with that, because we can never always appoint, appoint the best person to the right job. And that comes into how the academic and the scientific community operates. And that's what is now the task for the Academy of Science and Freedom, to revise and restructure how science operates. And the public health and this pandemic has sort of put this to, so it's, that is obvious, that it has the, the problems to be obvious. But these are things that have been sort of simmering for, for a long time in the scientific community. And academic peer review comes to the heart of this. And academic peer review is sort of have in three components to it. One is reviews when grants are evaluated, who should get research funding. Uh, reviews when uh, papers are published, who should publish, and promotions. Uh, in, in academics, we sort of call it get grants or get lost, and publish or perish. 
so all scientists know uh, this, that this is all the key to have, to be able to have a, a, a career in science and do some good work. Uh, now, if you look here, uh, there's sort of a cartel system. Uh, you have journal editors and reviewers of articles, grant review committees, promotion letter writers. They tend to be, do, do you see uh, uh, some similarities between these three groups? <laughs> so, uh, and it's not that it's like one cartel for all of science. It's like you have one cartel for each subfield of science. So there's like hundreds of these cartels. And some of them are actually kind of nice because they are encouraging discussions and so on, but there are many, many where there's sort of a viciousness and if you don't follow the leaders, then you're out. You're never gonna be funded. And there's sort of this click that you can't really upset them. So I think what's key to reforming how the scientific community operates is to have decentralization. So instead of one man, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who sits on the biggest pile of infectious disease money in the world, um, you can have multiple of these. And if Fauci leads the, the, the purple group there in the back, that's kind of okay, they're gonna mess up, but at least we have uh, uh, seven and other ones that are functioning, and then science will function. So this kind of decentralization, I think, is, is, is critical for the future of science and the future of the Enlightenment. And we can sort of illustrate that actually during this pandemic, because as we were sort of trying to find important information about what was going on with COVID, the, the important studies that sort of first gave us information about different things did not come typically from the two big powerhouses in science, the United States of America and the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. It came from the periphery of science. So like rich, small, rich countries that have good science, but they're small and they don't belong, they, they have this, belong to the same publication journals. So they have sort of, there the cartel has some power over them, but on the funding there's less because they have their own national funding agencies. So they are not as effective of this cartel system. They are to some extent, but not as much as scientists in the US and UK and other countries. So for example, about schools, the best studies came from Sweden and Finland. Should school be open or not? Do children transmit uh, COVID or not? Well, the best study came from Iceland. Not uh, what you think of as the scientific powerhouse of the world, but they, they did an excellent study on that. Zero prevalence. How many people had antibodies and how did that vary by age group and other things? The best study came from Spain. Mask, there's only been two randomized trials on mask. Uh, the first one was from Denmark. Uh, didn't show any effect, uh, but it was a very well designed study. Uh, natural immunity, the best early study came from Israel. It showed that uh, uh, immunity from, natural immunity from having recovered uh, was better than vaccine induced immunity. Uh, F, the vaccine efficacy, how, how fast does the protection wane? It protects quite uh, fast for infection. It lasts longer for serious disease. The best data come from Qatar and from Sweden. Vaccine safety from Israel and Denmark. So it came from these sort of smaller peripheral countries. And I think that's because they are not as dragged into this scientific cartel system as, uh, as we are in the United States and they are in the United Kingdom. So what do we do this specifically? And these are just some suggestions and that we want to work with uh, in the academy, and these are not sort of the finished uh, plan or anything like that, but um, there's really no need to have competitive uh, scientific journals where as a scientist you have to publish in the Lancet or, or in science. Um, at one point, these journals were important because they had to be sent to the libraries in the paper copy so that people could read them but we don't really need that service anymore. So now the only thing they do is sort of to be a hurdle for who gets to be the prominent scientist who later will get funding and promotions. So it sort of serves a purpose for the cartel system, but it doesn't really serve much else purpose for the scientific community. 
So we, we can instead have just the universities and research institutes having their journals and just publish it wherever you happen to work. With, uh, and if, if you're a professor at Stanford, I think, uh, why stop them from publishing? I mean, if, if they're not good scientists, they shouldn't be working at Stanford, so just let them publish. And then we can have open peer review so that it's published together with, you see what, what uh, the reviewers actually think. Now it's, uh, it's a secret anonymous peer review, and it's never shown what they think about it. So instead we should say, well, Jay wrote a, a paper, and uh, one reviewer thinks that's the greatest paper ever, and another thinks that, no, there's completely fatal flaws or whatever, but you have these reviews that comes with it. Uh, I think that's like a uh, common probably not, not, not very likely unless it's some professor from Harvard like Walensky <laughs> or something, but, but I don't know. Uh, uh, it will be much rapid publications. Uh, open access so anybody can read it instead of having a, a, a financial toll on reading it. And then uh, if I write something and I say, oh yeah, that comment was actually good, I should change it, then I can change the paper. Uh, just like they do with software. Uh, so those are some of the ideas sort of improve the whole publication, communication system, and research funding. We need, as I said, multiple independent funding agencies. Uh, I think also now we sort of give grants to somebody who can come up with some ideas of what to do. But why not instead reward people who did past research, uh, good, really excellent research in the past, because they will probably do good research next time also. Uh, and that gives them more freedom to actually pursue what they want, because what happens to me sometimes, I really want to do this thing, but I don't have any funding, but I do it anyhow, but then I do these other two things because that's my funding. So I have to do those two things that are less important just so I can also do the important one. Uh, so I think you can do, get much better and more rapid research to, uh, if you had that system instead. And then when it comes to young researchers, instead of having grants committees do it, you can yet let the universities sort of select that. Now the universities first hire them, and then they have to write a grant for NIH to get funded, and if they don't, they get fired eventually, like it had to go a few years, and otherwise they're not. But why don't just sort of combine that? It will be more efficient. So these are just some ideas for it. And for promotion, I think, qualitative evaluations rather than quantitative, but if you do quantity, we need better research metrics for doing those things. And basically ignore, ignore what journal it is. Uh, it should be the actual research that's important, not what journal it happened to have been published in. So those are some of the ideas that we have uh, uh, for re reforming the, the scientific community that we want to work with in, in the academy. Uh, we also want to work with other things like uh, 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 scientific communications to the public and so on. Uh, so uh, a couple of weeks ago, I wrote another tweet. Uh, and I don't know if this is accurate or not, so I'm just putting it out there. Uh, so you can, you're welcome to argue with me here. But uh, during the 16th century Reformation, many lay people understood the Bible better than most priests. During the 21st century pandemic, many lay people understood science better than most scientists. And long-term implication will be equally profound. <laughs> so thank you very much. And uh, we're looking forward now to have a discussion uh, with all of you. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Koldorf. Um, we do have time for a few questions. Uh, we have a few students down here in the front. You'll see them holding the microphones. If you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for them to come to you before asking so that everyone can hear. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I'm a retired family physician and I wasn't the top uh, kid in my class, but I sort of remember when you got chicken pox, you had lifelong immunity, and nobody ever said to me, employer or otherwise, you've got to get a chicken pox vaccine. So I'm going to ask you a dumb question. Did science change two years ago? 
No. <laughs> what, what, what he said... <laughs> I mean, I think some vaccines are still quite important, as you know, as a family physician. Um, it's just you wouldn't give uh, a, a measles vaccine to somebody who's already had measles and recovered. You, you don't, you have to, you have, when you treat patients, uh, you treat the patient. You're not treating a, an aggregate, you're treating the person in front of you. And so vaccine advice should be tailored to the person in front of you. Uh, it just seems like that's not a controversial thing, but apparently in two, the last two years it has been. here. So I'm going to be the contrarian here tonight. I'm just, so there was an article published uh, in Nature recently uh, about SSRIs and how there's no connection whatsoever between SSRIs and between serotonin and depression, yet it's a $25 billion industry. Um, there was an article published in Science showing that um, amyloid beta plaque and, and the, the treatments on that are completely falsified since 2006. Um, You've got the Sackler family scandal with oxycodone. You've got children's hospitals that are sexually mutilating children around the country. Uh, you've got medical schools now that are teaching critical race theory. Um, so my question to you guys is, why, why do you want to restore faith in these public institutions? What, what, what makes you think they deserve it? Uh, I mean, and that last uh, tweet that you put on, um, that, the people, that people understand science better than the scientists, that seems to me to be correct. So I'm just wondering if you guys could kind of answer that question for me. I don't think they do deserve uh, trust or our respect. Uh, so, uh, but uh, we have to restore, I think, the integrity of science. Uh, and with our generation of scientists, I don't know if, if I'm very hopeful, but the future generation hopefully can restore uh, how science should operate and restore the integrity of, of science. And if the integrity is restored, then I think trust will eventually come back. But uh, I think the key thing is to, to, to help restore how science and the scientific community operates, because now it does not deserve our trust. Yeah, if I can add something uh, very brief. It's not science that's been destroyed. Scientists and the credibility of these scientists, particularly those in power, have lost our trust. But that's not to say that science somehow doesn't exist or factual hypothesis-driven experiments don't yield good results. And I think we have to be careful uh, to just throw up our hands and say, okay, we're not going to listen to anybody about anything. I mean, I'm not sure that's the right answer. So I, uh, and that's one of the things. We, this is a huge challenge to, to fix it. As Martin has said many times, science is broken. Uh, but it didn't mean that the, uh, the whole field should be ignored. It means that we have, to, we have a lot of work to do to fix that trust because we must, as a society, uh, have trust in these fundamental institutions. It's not just science, it's education, okay? It's, it's believe it or not, government. It would be nice to be able to trust government. Uh, the media is very critical and has damaged uh, the trust that we need in the media significantly. They are the filter of information. So, uh, you know, yeah, I'm just making the point that, uh, you know, the challenge is great, but uh, it's critical, really, that we, uh, in a free society with so many different opinions and people, uh, restore trust in, in expertise. It doesn't mean that we don't have a burden on ourselves to make sure we individually know what we're talking about for ourselves and our families. Let me, let me add just a second to that, because that's such an important question. Um, I, I, when I was little, I loved science. Anyone else fall in love with science when they were little? It's a beautiful thing. It is. It's an absolutely amazing way to, to think about the world. It's a powerful tool to understand the world, and it involves a sense of awe and wonder um, uh, that, that's worth building an institution that's trustworthy to, to defend it. 
And it just fills me with sadness to see what's happened. Because uh, what is science, why is there distrust now? It's because science has become a mechanism of power and control rather than some, uh, a, a, a process of learning about the world that's filled with awe and wonder. Uh, and so I want, I want that science that I had, that vision of science I had as a child, as a kid, as a teenager, as, a, as frankly still now, I want that to be true. I want that, I desperately want that back. Um, maybe it was never here, but I, I, I think, but it could be. Like it's, it's, uh, it's, it's worth trying for. And that's one of the missions I think of, of the Academy of Science and Freedom is to try to reform science so it's worthy of that trust. Worthy, it's, 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 it has that integrity so you, you trust it for a good reason, not just because people tell you to. Gentlemen, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight and for this talk. There's an inter interesting juxtaposition. As you're speaking right now, President Biden was addressing the nation and denouncing uh, the extremist MAGA Republicans as a direct threat to democracy. And I think that shows this crisis has amplified a very fundamental division in our society. And all of you have addressed tonight ways to reform science, and, and especially in public health. Once science enters the public sphere, then it's political, because science is observations about the world. But when you put a gun to my head, or, or you threaten my career, if you don't do this, there's an outcome. That's not science. That's, that's force. That's politics. And so the question I have tonight is whether or not you believe that scientific funding from the taxpayer, um, can that even continue? Can we really have publicly funded science, science in a nation so divided in which you see the religious aspect uh, infect science and then uh, in a sense of liberal piety. You know, if you don't believe in transgenderism, there are consequences, et cetera. Uh, so can we have taxpayer-funded science, or is that something that needs to be on the chopping block? You know, there, there, there was um, Dwight, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, the president, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, when he gave his farewell address, that you remember he warned against the military-industrial complex? In that same speech, he warned against the rule of scientists. Go, look, go back and look at the speech. It's really interesting. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that it's impossible to have a scientific bureaucracy that funds science, even with federal dollars, if, if, the, if controls are in place, but, you know, like Martin Martin's vision of, of decentralization. It's possible, but we have, as a polity, must demand it. Because right now, the scientific bureaucracy we have is, is, a, is a boot on your, our neck, right? So that's, I think, the, the sense of your, your, your question. It's an open question whether we can or, or can't. Uh, I, I want to work toward making a science and a government that, that makes that happen, make, allows that to happen, that's worthy of trust. But we are very far away from that at this, mo at this moment. Yeah, I, I think that uh, Martin uh, has outlined this many times and, and very well tonight, which is that the key isn't to abolish government-funded research, in my view, uh, but there's a couple of things that are very important. One, in the, the message I think he's trying to focus on here, is uh, decentralize. Okay, you cannot have a monopoly. You cannot have a, uh, a, a, a massive domination of science by any kind of bureaucracy, but, but by any single entity. That's number one. And number two, there's this separation that we must remember that should exist but didn't, which is the scientific research funding and the sort of public uh, health leadership and sort of medical science public uh, leadership, which is sort of different, must be distinguished further. This is the uh, wall analogy of Jay's. Uh, and is listed actually as one of the most important ethical principles of public health. And that is that we need to restore the role of public health agencies and leaders to advisory. They were never meant to set rules. They were never meant to set laws. There was never an intent for our elected officials to totally abrogate what they were elected to do, which is lead, and to just say, I'll do whatever the CDC says. I'll do whatever the public health people next to me say. That's not part of the equation. That is a gross failure of leadership, and that's a part of the solution. Good, even good evening, gentlemen. I'm a pediatrician and a research scientist. 
Um, I've had to live through a twilight zone of all the rules of how infectious disease work uh, just didn't apply anymore for two years. But when a child asks me if something's going to hurt, I always say yes, because you don't lie to patients, because that's a crime against your oath, and they'll never forgive you, which is what's happened on a national scale. My question is, we've had more than something that shook our civilization. This is an important issue. But there are other things. There's um, psychology, learning science, sexuality, climate science, all kinds of areas that are suffering under similar conditions and the similar problems. What can we do as uh, medical professionals or other types of scientists, what can someone like me do to participate in the academy, in the discussions, uh, to participate in the framing of this going forward? Because that's, that's something that's been sort of a mystery to me, and I was wondering if, if you gentlemen could address that. Well, I mean, I can start. Uh, part of the structure, as you sort of get the feeling this is a work in progress, I want to make a caveat there. Uh, we have already had a couple of uh, events. Part of this is sort of not necessarily the answer, but the, the exposure of the problem. And that involves, tr to a, a great extent, educating both the general public, but also the, the healthcare fields. I, I don't think most people that I know, uh, even in medicine, are really either aware or conversant with what, what has happened because people lead their lives um, individually. So we have had a lot of, uh, we have had several public events. We are engaging people all over the country uh, to not just get their input, but to sort of form working groups. We have a list of activities that we're going to do. We have one coming up actually, October 21, that has to do with policy on uh, education and the dissent in science on university campuses being snuffed out. So th there's a lot of things happening here that we didn't uh, come forward with. Uh, but the part about the general public and healthcare professionals in general is, uh, you know, we need your support. I mean, one thing is, okay, I'm just going to say we need funding to get these things done. Uh, but we also want the, the healthcare community uh, to be involved in participating, and we envision as we do events in Washington, D.C., but also we'll do some things here and get working groups going that we, we want uh, people engaged in the community to be on these working groups to formulate how to proceed with the ideas that Martin, uh, uh, you know, listed because there are many about things like the scientific process articles. Communication is very important. I think the medical community, okay, in my feel, feeling uh, was a gross failure Okay, doctors were a, a failure in this and communicating with their patients and knowing what they were talking about in stopping the fear and the pressure and the shame if people had a different idea of how to lead their lives. So the communication side is very important and we, we want the community doctors who actually deal with patients to be involved in these kinds of discussions. So I think there's gonna be uh, a tremendous amount of possible participation uh, as we roll out things and as we get things planning. And so just, uh, you know, keep in, keep in touch and keep, keep an eye out for what we're doing. I think one important role of the Academy, a long-term goal, is uh, public education about how the, how the scientific uh, system or you know, community has been broken and how it can be fixed and how it should be fixed. Now, the three of us cannot do all of that. We need the participation of dozens and hundreds of thousands of people to do that. Uh, and we don't know exactly what the nature of that is, but to have various symposia and meetings and educational opportunities and courses. Uh, and I think it's important to get this uh, into sort of uh, uh, how high school students learn about, about science and how college students learn about science. So that's an enormous effort, I think, that will require a lot of people, uh, uh, educators, uh, faculty at uh, colleges, uh, physicians, uh, and, and so on, uh, and, and working scientists in, 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 in different fields uh, who's working in industry, for example. So uh, I think that's uh, an enormous undertaking, and uh, we don't know how successful we will be, but I think it's something we have to try to do. And it ha if, it's gonna, if it's ever gonna be successful, it has to involve 
uh, thousands of people who sort of help with these efforts. And, and I also think at the, at the local community level, a lot of these activities are going to have spinoffs so that we and others will be involved actually directly at, because things are going to happen locally. Nothing's going to happen good from uh, Washington, D.C. I said just one, one thing that wasn't addressed that with, you, know, you said it was so important. Science can't lie or else it loses credibility. Doctors can't lie. Uh, that is. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you have to, you have to, uh, you have to make a commitment to tell the truth, even when it's really, really, really inconvenient. Um, that's one of, I think, one of the ethical principles of public health. We, I, th I think, um, the kind of public participation that Martin and, and Scott are talking about, that's going to be, if it's just the three of us on the stage, we're going to fail. Just honestly, it's just we are. Um, but if if uh, if we can build a community of people who who talk to their patients about things about the, they in California there's a law a, a bill that's in, in on the governor's desk right now that will uh, take away the licenses of physicians that dissent against the ortho or, or, or uh, essentially public health orthodoxy about covid specifically it's more than covid actually it's very general yeah so it's it's not and it's not just covid essentially those kinds of those kinds of impositions of power need to have a vigorous response by the public whose interests are not served by that. Um, so I think I want to build a community that, that, that's attuned to this sort of thing happening, pushes back when it happens, helps spread the word about how amazing science can be, should be, what the ethical principles are, uh, you know, how to, how to communicate those. That's that, and we need just a very large community of, to, to, to accomplish that. I'm always an optimist. I think we can do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. By the way, uh, you, you might want to uh, ask the candidates who are running for office if they believe in the ethical principles of public health, and you can hand them the piece of paper. This will be the last question of this evening. So this evening brings into focus a problem which affects many areas in a country, whether in science, penology, parenting, education, uh, climate control. We are not supposed to talk. We're not supposed to talk and have a debate. Therefore, I see a new golden rule being created that encompasses and describes all this. Problems never discussed. Our problems never resolved. And that's where we are. I mean, what you, what you do is you're painting a very bleak picture of the current reality of how science actually works in our, in our lives, right? A, a picture of science as Not a way Not only of, science, but various other areas in our, in our yeah. society. Uh, it's political correctness stymieing us from having a discussion. I mean, I, th I think we felt, the three of us have felt the, the, the sharp pointy edge of that, end of that, during the pandemic. Like each of us has been canceled one way or the other through the pandemic. Um, I, I don't think we can solve all of society's problems. I mean, I mean that's not, you know, uh, but I think that we can, we can work on the problems we have in front of us that, 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 where, where, the, where we have some expertise and some possibility and some insight. Um, I, I, think, I believe that reform of society starts from small places and builds out. Uh, I think that's how you, and when, and when you have a, a pandemic like we've just been through, where the corruption at the heart of so many systems has been thoroughly open to the, where you can, everyone can see it. Um, that is, is an opportunity for reform. Nobody wants to live like we lived the last two and a half years. Not really. Not our political enemies, not, nobody. Uh, and so that means that we can build an enormous coalition if we could just help people understand the vision of what we want, which is an open society where science plays the role it's supposed to play, where it's not a boot on your neck, but, so, but it's something to help empower people, discover new truths, uh, fill you with a sense of awe and wonder, um, that where 
the, uh, the political authorities aren't using science to get their way, but are consulting it so that they can understand what's possible and then, then, then help make, and then make decisions that reflect your values. Right? That's the society we want to we want to call for. That's the vision we want. I don't see that as a partisan vision. I think it's possible. I think I mean, it's a very attractive way to think about the world. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm afraid we're out of time. I hope you'll join us out in the lobby for uh, hospitality. Uh, once again, thank you. <laughs>